welcome everyone. We'll be starting here in a couple minutes. Just gonna let everyone get into the room and that way we don't have any false starts. Thank you for making the time. I don't know if anyone has the ability or you're familiar enough with Zoom, but on average, do you, does anyone here think about like, you know, ancient Rome or the Roman Empire at least once a week? I don't. <laughs> you don't? All right. I guess I'm the weirdo. There's this, uh, I forget what I saw. Somebody shared it with me, uh, an old colleague. And she goes, is this true? And I said, yeah, it is true. And she's like, you know, if it, that screenshot said that men think of uh, ancient Rome at least, you know, once per day or something like that. And she's like, why? I'm like, well, you know, for a variety of different reasons, but, you know, we'll go on with it. That's a very interesting fact. I read about that just this morning, actually. I thought, found it very intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it weird, though? Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to think about it all the time, so from here on out. All right, let's give everyone a minute or so more to gather. I think we've got more people joining. All right, it's uh, two minutes past. I think uh, we'll get started. Um, do we look like we've got uh, a good consensus of people joining? We got a quorum, right. official. All right, we're officially a quorum. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Zero Trust Board Workshop presented by Zscaler and NTT. Um, to just get a little housekeeping out of the way, uh, this session is being recorded uh, and is, um, uh, so everybody is aware of it. We are recording this session. The recording has already started. Um, with that said, uh, we'll get started and introduce you to your two hosts. Uh, today, along with myself, you have uh, Brian, who's the Chief Technology Evangelist for Zscaler, and uh, he will be doing a great show for you, the highlight for today. Uh, and I will be uh, talking about uh, our journey as NTT in not only using Zscaler from a customer perspective, but also as a consumer uh, of the product. So, um, you know, I won't go into too much about a bio, look me up on LinkedIn. You know, we can certainly connect after this, look forward to working. Uh, with all of you uh, on this. So um, just talk a little bit about NTT and who we are. Uh, NTT uh, is a global company with about, you know, hundred over a hundred billion dollars in revenue. We've been in existence for 150 years. Um, we've got about 330,000 people. Um, we spend about 3.6 3 billion in research. And we also have a 500 million venture fund uh, for startups. Uh, NTT data specifically is about a $40 billion revenue company, 210,000 people operating in about 55 countries uh, with customers and offices across the globe. So, you know, all very dry stuff. Uh, wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of a fun fact is most of you have used emojis and um, not sure if you knew, but NTT invented the emoji. Our NTT research division um, had uh, created the first emoji. If you look it up on Wikipedia or something like that, you know, you will see uh, the accreditation. 
of it. So, so we do some fun stuff along with some other things in our research division um, and, you know, some very uh, interesting items there that come from it. So without wasting too much time, uh, let's start getting into a little bit of the uh, meat and potatoes about what we're here to talk about. And we're really focused here about talking about why organizations use zero trust, right? So zero trust uh, was really designed um, to be to, to support the security model for any user, any device, anywhere, right? I think those of us who have been in the technology space for a long time have looked at it and said, you know, we've always had this any user, any device, anywhere. And it's been a tremendous goal for technology to reach that. Zero trust is really probably the first framework, if you will, that from a security perspective allowed it. And zero trust obviously accelerated with COVID when everybody had to move from quote unquote, a you know working in the office to being virtually 100% remote. So one of the things that we see is you know, a lot of people adopting zero trust. And one of the things that I always tell people is zero trust is a journey, not a destination. Uh, it's a process that involves continuous improvement uh, and looking at it because the threat landscape is always changing, right? So as part of NTT's journey uh, to zero trust, you know, we wanted to implement a tool that would allow our folks to be productive from anywhere. Even though as a consulting organization, we had a large number of our users who were always on the road, if you will, we've actually had more people, you know, uh, in support services, you know, whether that would be accounting, HR, who all had to go home and work, you know. So, so the, the key to implementing any new technology is, you know, what are you, from a business driver perspective, what are we trying to achieve? So obviously, you know, you want to improve your protection, provide flexibility. And I think the most key element is improve the employee experience with that, right? How many times have we heard, oh, security means you're making the user experience harder? Well, I think one of the good news of the good news in today's world is there are tools like ZCMR that actually help you achieve that, right? To improve the user experience and so forth. So moving on to why NTT and um, Zscaler for Zero Trust, let me take a little bit of a step back and talk a little bit about Zero Trust from a little bit more of a framework perspective. So Zero Trust has five pillars that they talk about. People, devices, networks, applications, and data. Those are the four, five core things that are the pillars of what you are trying to protect. And that is wrapped around the seven tenets of principles um, around Zscaler and Zero Trust, right? So the seven tenets are the data sources and compute resources are all considered resources. All communication is secured, right? I think in the old world, we lived in a dimension where things were set up to be, well, I'm in the office, we don't need to secure communication, you know, it's okay because you're within the walls of the castle, you're within the moat, whatever the case may be. Um, same way for access. If you logged in once, you know, it considered you to be trusted for the rest of the time. Here, access is based on each session. So every time you access a resource, you're dealing with needing to verify and authenticate, the, not only authenticate, but ensure that the user truly has access. So access is granted in very much a dynamic policy basis along with behavioral and environmental attributes. So for example, right now I'm logged in here. If all of a sudden the login for me comes from a very different geography, that probably means that one, of those connections is, is not authorized, right? Somebody has got a hold of my credentials, somebody is trying to spoof being me, et cetera. The other uh, couple of things that are very important is 
that an organization monitor and measure the integrity and security of all assets. And by assets, I mean, these are compute, these are data, these are networks, et cetera. And authentication is always dynamic and strictly enforced. And then the last part, which I think is the most important piece is the organization should collect information and use it to improve security. The threat landscape is constantly changing. So one of the things that we chose to do is we use Zscaler to help us build around these pillars and tenants of, of zero trust in terms of how we could improve, right? So the key for us was ensuring we had an easy way to implement something. And the other thing was to provide that seamless user information. Moving on to the next item, we're going to talk about entity zero trust solution. Why did we implement this? Like every organization, COVID, you know, we started our journey back in 2018, but accelerated it with the advent of COVID in 2020. You know, people want to be more flexible in the way they work. Most organizations allow people today to spend some amount of time working remotely. So the traditional model of working in an office protected by firewalls, you know, uh, was something that became much more difficult because again, the goal was any user, any device, anywhere. So how does one work through these things to ensure that they get the thing? So NTT zero trust solution was, we're not gonna trust anyone. So we wanna take a proactive approach and limit access to things. We always wanna verify, this is one of the key things. Authenticate and authorize every access request. You know, access is not just based on user ID, but device posture and more. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, if I am accessing the data from Texas, where I live, and then all of a sudden, two hours later, there is access from somewhere in Asia, that's probably an impossibility that I've traveled to Asia in the space of two hours. So those kinds of behavioral and environmental factors need to be done. And then the third, and what I believe is the most important thing is to continuously monitor, analyze, and continue to look at the environment and make improvements to it. So how did we go about implementing this? So we implemented this in a division with about 50,000 people. Um, and I think it's very important to understand that this rollout happened within 30 days. Um, it gave us a cloud native platform. It provided us with advanced cyber threat and, and data protection. And ultimately the rollout was smooth and it was a very seamless experience. From a user experience perspective, uh, a notice went out, we deployed it. There was virtually no disruption to this user experience. It was completely done through a backend process. Users continued to work as they had before with no performance degradation, okay? So it's, it's very key. Now, everybody will say, well, you should have, took you more than 30 days. That was the implementation piece. Whenever you work on a zero trust architecture, you know, the thing that I tell folks to always do is first is define your requirements, right? I think if you remember a few slides ago, we talked about what were the business drivers? What were the key things we were trying to achieve, right? And even though there's commonality of that across the globe, with a variety of organizations about improving security posture, improving user experience, take some time out first and foremost to understand what you are trying to achieve, right? And so with that, you can typically get to a better state. When you get to rollout, the rollout can be seamless because that way you've done all of the prep work ahead of the time and you're able to have a smooth and seamless experience when you roll it out. Okay, so the next thing is really, what was the results of this, right? So these, 
Zscaler was instrumental to our deployment. So as I said, not only do we consult and help organizations do it, we are also a consumer of uh, Zscaler, right? So, you know, the best way I can tell you is the results from our perspective was the seamless user experience, uh, ready for the future workplace. And ultimately we combined productivity and security. Okay, and, and I'm gonna read a quote from um, uh, Steve Williams, the enterprise CISO at NTT Data Services. He said, I think the best feather in the cap for Zscaler and our ability to implement it is that people didn't talk about the change, it just worked. People could continue to do their jobs and they didn't have the friction of dealing with the new technology. And I think that very much encapsulates the experience we had. It was something that people were notified that this change was occurring, but ultimately nothing significantly changed on this front. So with that, I am going to turn it to my colleague, Brian, uh, to talk a little bit more specifically about the Zscaler solution and architecture and technical items. So Brian, if you will take over, I will stop the share. All right, thank you very much, Ben. Wonderful job, I appreciate you. And uh, hopefully right now you guys can see the, uh, the old Ron Swanson pyramid of greatness, but uh, it just gives me a second pause. Let me get behind my setup here so we can have a, a quick minute to talk about our feelings. So uh, <clears throat> nothing against Ben, uh, but I, I hate PowerPoint. So no more PowerPoint today. Uh, we've dodged that bullet. And uh, you know, with that said, uh, yeah, my name is Brian Beach. I've uh, been with the company about six and a half years. You see me looking off in this direction just because uh, I have another monitor right here. Someone's talking to me. Maybe I know what's going on. Uh, I will be writing on a piece of glass. And yes, the back wall was painted in my house. My wife is not a giant fan. So we have like 30 minutes to talk about Zero Trust. I need like three hours to do it. So we're going to put this thing in you know, the fastest gear possible and jump right into it. So we're talking about Zero Trust. I like to talk about some of the assets that you have to kind of cover. So, you know, you have uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service as well. And usually those are the, the, the usual suspects, right? We got like GCP, Azure, and AWS. And we come over here and we look at other applications that companies are using today. So we got SaaS-based application. And those SaaS based applications are, you know, limited and not, you know, not everything. So maybe you got like M365, maybe some Salesforce.com, uh, maybe ServiceNow, right? Maybe even a Chupacabra. I'm sure that we have lots of those different things that are out there. And then, of course, you have to give access to the internet to our employees. If we don't, what are they going to do? They can go work somewhere else where they can play on the internet and do different things. So we got the internet. And on the internet, we have to protect. Things like maybe personal email, nefarious websites riddled with malware like BrianBeach.com. And as much as I would like to say the data centers are all gone, the reality is, you know, people still have data centers. I'll we'll drop the data center here real quick as well. And at your data center, you're probably doing some type of uh, segmentation that's over there. You get your, your legacy uh, security stack going on one second nope this is the data center i apologize for the squeaking in the background and at the data center you probably have applications hanging out over here so maybe it's the uh, applications one two and three maybe you have some of those similar applications up over here maybe it's all of them maybe it's just a couple and then on that note <clears throat> that security stack that you have Really, what is that? That could be like a, maybe it's an SSL appliance. Maybe you got some VPN over there. Maybe a secure web gateway, next generation firewall. Uh, perhaps you're doing some CASB on it, uh, DLP. The list kind of just kind of goes on and on and on. And uh, maybe some sandboxing as well. But all in the name of security. So you have these things and it was a good idea back in the day when everyone was kind of on-prem, but, you know, times have changed. 
And then where are your users? Users and other things you have to worry about are going to be over here. So we're going to have like these remote offices. And at the remote offices, maybe you have a few, maybe you have hundreds. It doesn't really matter to me. I can help you out with everything. Maybe you have like SD WAN or legacy routers over here. Uh, you know, God forbid you still have a firewall, but you know, maybe you have a firewall over here as well. And you have, you know, you're probably doing some type of segmentation over here. You'll have your users on one side of the pie. And maybe you have like, uh, you know, IOT, OT environments, maybe some guest stuff as well. And we have to figure out a way to kind of keep all of them isolated and sexy and, and whatnot. And of course, we have the uh, the COVID superstars, right? The people that are, you know, working from anywhere. And one narrative that I want to make sure that I articulate with you folks today is that when I talk about working from anywhere, I'm talking about working at home, at Starbucks, abroad, and right here. So whatever story that you choose to receive today, uh, just know that that's the same story, whether it's here or here, right? I don't really care about locations, worrying about IPs and stuff like that. That's, that's archaic and nonsense, and I don't want to do it. Uh, but from a work from anywhere perspective, you have stuff on the endpoint. And, uh, you know, CrowdStrike is a very good partner uh, for both NCT and us. Uh, so I'll call them out specifically. And maybe on your endpoint, maybe has some, uh, you know, some fatigue running different things. So maybe has some type of EDR on here. Well, that's actually CrowdStrike. Sorry. I always leave the crowd curve with EDR. Anyways, maybe you have a VPN client on this. Uh, maybe you have some sort of weird secure web gateway, uh, maybe some type of digital experience monitoring, uh, DLT, maybe some CASB. And at the end of the day, you probably start to feel like you have endpoint fatigue. So this gives me the opportunity to kind of switch gears a little bit and introduce the Zscare Cloud, or what we like to call the Zero Trust Exchange. Hopefully someone on the Zscare side in the chat can translate any three-letter acronyms that you might not be used to, but ZTE, Zero Trust Exchange, and I'll try to steer away from anything specific from Zscare from here on out. But the goal really is to leverage our cloud because we're like we're like Visa, wherever we, where you want to be. We have 150 points of presence globally. We have 50 million users and workloads on our cloud at any given point in time, which means if we see something bad for somebody else, like in the Netherlands, then we're just going to put the Band-Aid on it and stop that thing everywhere, right? So you think advanced threat protection, sandboxing, pretty much everything you see right here, I could do up in this cloud. Uh, but I digress. So let's let's talk about the work from anywhere person because it's got a similar story right here and we'll kind of dovetail around. So to get traffic to the Zero Trust Exchange, I have an endpoint agent. And this endpoint agent is called Zscare Client Connector. And really its sole goal in life is to send traffic over here, so we can look at the, the traffic and, and, and make determinations on it. Now, with that said, I, uh, you know, friends don't let friends deploy VPN anymore. So my endpoint agent can help displace VPN. Obviously secure web gateway, because you know that about me. Digital end user monitoring, I can do that as well. CASB, again, this it's just one, one tool to rule them all, and as well as DLP. So, uh, you know, from a CrowdStrike perspective or any EDR, I, I wholeheartedly believe that you'll still have that. I think that, uh, you know, EDR should be on all of your endpoints. But, uh, you know, my analogy here would be that I believe that like, all cars should have airbags. But I think it's far more important to prevent the accident from even happening, which means if I can protect the user before it even happens on the endpoint and stop it over here with the Zero Trust Exchange, far better solution and integration. So as traffic gets up over here, we want to be able to identify who the user is. And rest assured, I'm not going to make your life stink. It's in federate ID identity. So think SSO, and it's all those usual suspects. Your pings, Okta, um, Azure Active Directory, it doesn't matter. And so as traffic comes over here, I want to know who the user is, and based upon their identity, produce a verdict. Allow or deny what you're familiar with. I can warn so we can coach them into doing different things. I can put them in the browser isolation as well, and I can even deceive. But in the interest of uh, connectivity, I'm going to use Vin for this entire conversation. Let's say Vin wants to go out to the internet, right? It hits my zero trust exchange. And when I look at his identity, 
I'm going to be decrypting SSL, TLS. So if he's going out the personal email, I can allow him to maybe check email, but not send email. Or check and send email, but not do attachments. Or send, receive, do attachments, but not finally anything DLP as well. And on that note, while my endpoint agent sends all the traffic over here, and this is really where I do my policy enforcement, the reality is in a zero trust world, what would happen if this user tried to like maybe print something or maybe a local file share? Or what would happen if they pulled out their cell phone and took a picture of it, right? Now, this is actually where it can start to help as well. So by enforcing DLP, always like kind of inline, uh, whether it's going out to the internet, SAS, private over here into your private cloud environments as well, you can do it on the endpoint. And what I can do that is I can basically stop that user from printing something locally on their printer and stop them from doing that. Same thing, they can't copy it off to a file share or USB drive. And as far as someone using their mobile phone to take a picture of that sensitive information, I can help out with that. I know what you're thinking. Does, does East Clear have like a goon squad? We're going to have a bunch of people running around baseball bats hitting them in the head. Tell them to do dumb, dumb, don't do dumb things. No, what actually what we're going to do is we can actually digitally watermark things that are sensitive information to you. That way, even if they did take a picture of it, guess what? It's going to have their identity all over the place and they don't want to get caught doing bad things. As far as like nefarious websites like brianbeach.com that could have malware on there, ransomware is zero day. I want you guys to know that I'm going to reject ransomware, zero day malware, the exact same way I used to reject presents from, you know, from mom's new boyfriend. Like, no thanks, Dale. But rather than be very kind of binary about it, like it was either good or bad, in that, that continuous evaluation of what's going on, I produce like a sandbox activity report. And what's nice about this is you can see it via command or uh, API, or UI, or in logging. But I'm going to give you a score. And that score is 0 being benign, 100 being the worst thing ever, right? Like It's like, it's kind of like the dog pooped on the carpet and the Roomba ran it over. That's disgusting. You don't want that in your environment whatsoever. But I give you all these IOCs. That way you can plug it into your other threat tools to, do, uh, to help execute a threat hunting. I can look for polymorphic code, registry your assignment. I can even provide you the original binary, drop files, or even a PCAP. But if I scroll down a little bit further, give you some file properties, right? Uh, process summaries, you plug that in SCCM as well, drop file locations. And probably one of the coolest things right there is a screenshot. Now that screenshot wasn't detonated down over here on this endpoint, detonating my cloud. So you can help orchestrate with this. See, if this comes in and we, we have it successfully blocked it, you can just put an email out or whatever you're doing with service now to your to the field. Hey, if you see this on your computer, unplug it and throw it out the window with bad news. And then at the very bottom, maybe you don't want to have to open up a PCAP. You just want to do your own forensics. I show you the network packets. I show you the protocol and the destination it was going after. You can plug that into your SIM and get a good baseline of any uh, other possible avenues to compromise your environment. So I'm securing the user. And by the way, I'm doing that. <clears throat> over here as well, right? And so that user, the last thing I want to do is hairpin a user to go back over here to the data center. So when you have Zscare, the goal really is to come over here and then directly out, allow the good, block the bad, stop the stupid. Now, when it comes to SaaS-based applications, I have complete granularity in there. I can do the browser isolation, even on the naked internet or over here as well. But I'm always uh, inspecting that traffic. I'm looking into it. I am tenant aware, but at the same time, I don't even have to care about uh, residency or, or, or tenants that are there. And back in the day, when you think of like data protection, you know, you might have some users that are, you know, like, we love regex and dictionaries. We have the most dictionaries in the world. Like that's problematic. Like that sucked even when DLP was on-prem and now you're trying to do that in the cloud. And really one of the things that we did is we took a new approach to this, which is if I scan in line between all of your users and all of your data, then guess what? I kind of know your data better than you know your data. So by leveraging machine learning, I can dynamically classify sensitive information and prevent bad things from happening, which means that this user is in a call center and they're doing something and they try to take a piece of information that might be PII or PCI or HIPAA, whatever you want to call it, and send it over here in this direction. 
even though even though I have never seen and created a policy on it, I can immediately know that that's a bad thing that's going on and block the user from doing that. Now, if this user wants to take that same sensitive file and put it into OneDrive, which is like a sanctioned application, then I do it. I'm still decrypting, I'm still looking at it, but I'm performing an evaluation of yes, you can do that, or no, you cannot. We're moving along just fine right here. Um, I know what you might be thinking, back over here at the remote office, hey, Brian, you know, uh, I can't install an agent on IoT or guest networks, you're 100% right. And one thing I wanna make sure you guys understand is that uh, to do isolation over here, like a remote office, you don't need to have a firewall anymore, right? You can do that with a basic router, or even with something from Zscaler. And that something is called a branch connector. And I'm just gonna, we'll just call it the, uh, the Z connector, ZC. And the goal of this is to basically transparently intercept traffic and to send it up to the zero trust exchange. Whether it's guest Wi-Fi, IOT, it doesn't really matter. This thing's gonna take that traffic and then send it over here where I can do all the inspection. And since it's coming from a location that I know and understand, I can really start to like tighten things down and prevent bad things from happening, right? There's probably no reason on earth that an IoT or an OT network needs to talk to anything really out on the internet. Maybe a SaaS-based application, if it was like a thermostat, but OT stuff probably needs to come over here and talk to that. So on that note, when we look at the data center, and I'm telling you, I have an agent that kind of just does it all, right? We just send all the traffic over here and we're good to go. What happens when Vin says, hey, I want to talk to application one on blah.com on port 1776. I'm feeling very patriotic today. The uh, the point here is I want you to know is that I, I support all ports and all protocols. Sometimes when you hear proxy, you think, oh, just 80 and 443. Not the case. I support everything. So what's going to happen? This little agent that I have is going to scoop up that traffic. It's gonna send it up over here to the Zero Trust Exchange. I'm gonna look at the identity of the user and I'm gonna produce a verdict. And that, that verdict is still the same. Allow, deny, isolate, steer, or deceive. But in the interest of connectivity, based upon everything that we're looking at, then has the ability to talk to application one, but I know what you're thinking. Brian came over here and said the VPN's dumb. Like friends only friends deploy VPN. So like, how do we get the traffic from here back down over here. Do we use like a, a dark alleyway? No, that's how Batman's parents died. And so what I do give you is a little VM. We call it an application connector, but that's den uh, denoted as a Z. The way this thing works is real simple. Number one, it reaches outbound to the zero trust exchange. It does this securely. I won't bore you with the details. And then two, it has application adjacency, which means it can talk to these internal apps. Now on VPN, that user really is your biggest liability. On um, VPN, you're putting this user back onto the network. Users on the network, that's that's disgusting, right? We don't wanna do yucky things anymore. So on this outbound connection, when he's asking for it, I do a micro tunnel back over here and I allow him to talk to application one. Now you can talk to application one on port 1776, but not SSH because there's not a rule allowing it. And by the way, policy enforcement's not done right here. It's not done right here. It's always done in the Zscare cloud. So from this moment forward, when you start to think of Zscaler and your internal applications, what I want you to think about is this. You're going to access your internal applications the exact same way you would M365. You can get there if you have identity, authorization, and posturing but never again will you be on the same network as the application. Think about that for a moment. All your SaaS-based stuff, you're not on their network, you're just accessing the, uh, the application. And it could be web-based, it could be file shares, it could be SSH, RDP, it doesn't matter. I have the ability to do all those things for you. Now, <clears throat> what happens when you say, well, Brian, we have these applications over here. How do we get the traffic over here, then up? And the answer is like, maybe you guys have like a, an express route or direct connect, you don't have to do that anymore, right? And the reason why is that's, that's anti-cloud. If this user is hanging out in Arizona, wink, wink, that's actually where I live. And this data center is in New York City. 
and you've deployed some of these apps on the West Coast, I think we all can agree that it would be insane to take this user, to put them here, to go up to the West, go basically go from Arizona to New York, back to San Jose, back to New York and over. Like that's that's what a crazy person would do. But we used to have to do it. Why? Because back in the day, this security stack was here. It wasn't available to you here. So now you're effectively, you're moving the security stack over here, which really means like that SSL, TLS visibility plans, it goes out the door. You don't need secure web gateway. Your investment in, the, uh, in next generation firewall will probably be completely diminished over here and reduced over here. The CASB, DLP, sandboxing all goes away. So the same fashion in which I get users over here to these internal applications, I do it over here as well. Give you that little Z-scare connector, it reaches outbound, and then has that application adjacency. Now, when Vin says, hey, get me application one, we are always looking at the telemetry from here to here, and here to here, and here to here, and on the back end as well, here to here, here to here, and here to here. You don't have a like a GSLB problem. That's actually up to me to figure out. Like, who's going to be the faster app for this user based upon their location? Well, in this use case, Vin is on is in Arizona. Should probably go over here to the West Coast. Not a problem. We look at that, evaluate the the uh, condition. Can they talk to this application? If it's a yes, boom, micro tunnel over here, and access to this application. And so, since we are connecting kind of like from the inside out. There's nothing listening over here or listening over here to the anonymous internet. Think about like a VPN back in the day. If it was hanging out over here in your DMZ, it's not locked down to anything, right? Like you, this is up to you to open this up to the internet and probably do multi-factor authentication, certificate-based authentication or something like that to protect it. But at the end of the day, there's always been some type of vulnerability. And what I'm saying is you don't need to have that right here. These could be able to do that for you. The only thing you have to worry about is just setting a policy, patches, upgrade, maintenance, not on you to have to figure out. So since all these applications are dark to the internet, and on top of that, if, if Vin doesn't have the ability to talk to application two or three, then he can't do anything with it. Like on VPN, he can do an MMAP and see everything. If, you, if Vin's at my house on this platform, the only thing he would see is like an Epson printer, Apple TV, and a Raspberry Pi. Everything else is dark. So you can't hack what you can't see. You can't DDoS it, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, brute force attacks. It's just not there. Now, one other little cool part to this entire story is like, maybe you're doing SD-WAN or MPLS, right? And I'll just kind of draw it like this. So you got MPLS, SD-WAN. And here's the sucky part. If you do everything we've talked about up to this point, when you put the user back onto the network, what happens? You take all that awesome, keep the user off the network and that awesome you know, user application segmentation, just throw it out right out the window. And so we look at this and say, you know what? I don't think you even need to have this anymore. How about I just do DIA for everything in this route? Allow this user, even when they're on quote unquote, the trusted network, when Vin asks for application two, comes up over here, it hits the zero trust exchange, it comes back down and allow him to access the application too. And what really happens is now every single user in your environment becomes its own little island. And if somebody does something really dumb, the only person that can affect is themselves. Over here, this remote office just becomes its own little island as well. And at the data center, every single application that you have becomes its own little island. So if there is a problem with application one, it doesn't affect anything else that's going on in the environment. So we look at this and say, all right, zero trust. You're smelling what the rock is cooking. Even if you have a workload, like IoT device, like let's, let's call it a video camera. It needs to uh, drop the videos back over here at the data, uh, data center. And the old way of doing that is that IoT device ride this mesh and come down. Well, remember that little connector thing I have over here? It can transparently take that, that traffic over there, that IoT device, right? It's gonna come over here, gonna ride this. Hit the exchange, I verify the identity of that workload, have it come back down. And in this particular, particular use case, that connector has the ability to talk to the database and allow 
that IoT device in the environment to come over here and to communicate and drop off those video files without even thinking. So in the last couple minutes here, another big one is going to be, I think it's, it's pretty clear and evident. I am a very big strategic point of control and visibility with the Zero Trust Exchange. But like, what about the stuff that's out of band as well, right? Because there different things can happen. And so we'll just call it out of band OOB. But really, this is the whole like Zscaler API story. So think of CNAP or SSPM or CSPM, like any of those four letter, three letter acronyms. I have the ability to, to cut service accounts, to be able to walk over here and look for misconfigurations, policy and enforce it. So a good example would be if a user has access to uh, something that has PII data in one drive, it's okay. But if they shared that outside of the organization with a, you know, Brian Deach at gmail.com, we probably want to know about this. This API has the ability to go through there, immediately find that misconfiguration, put the band on it. Same thing when we talk about, you know, maybe a, a S3 bucket right here that might have, you know, some type of DLP um, or data, you know, your, your IP. We have the ability, once again, come through and look for those misconfigurations. If it's an S3 bucket, should it be encrypted at rest? Yes. I want to enforce the exact same DLP, DLP policy that I do for the endpoint inline and at rest right here and then be able to revoke permissions and do different things and take that thing off the internet that way it's not open to everybody and the last part i'll leave you all with before you open up for q a and by the way the q a have at it i would love to hear everything you're putting in the chat window i can't read it it's too small for me uh would be about <clears throat> it is clearly evident that all roads point to the zero trust exchange so troubleshooting this, right, at first glance would probably seem like, oh my God, right? You're gonna get network and security, be able to get Zscare involved, and you're just trying to troubleshoot something. And people are saying that Zoom sucks. And you're like, <sighs> like, think about that. Back in the day, network would point at security, security point at network. Maybe the authentication guy is like, why the hell am I even in this room right now? And uh, that help desk ticket may have been open for a couple hours maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. Let's be real. Sometimes they're open for a month, right? And then it is quote unquote fixes itself. And so we looked at this and said, it'd be so much cooler if I could get network and security out of this entirely. I want a tier one help desk person to be able to go to the Zscare console, to type in Vin's name, and then immediately be presented with, this is the problem. And what could those, this problem actually be? So think about, how you would troubleshoot this historically. And then think about this. I'm gonna get you mean time to resolution or mean time to innocence in a matter of minutes as opposed to days or weeks or whatnot. So one thing, since I'm hanging out here at the endpoint, I get to see CPU. So what happens if like Adobe Updater or .exe is, is hounding and crushing that PC? Well, they could probably break Zoom, right? This is this consuming things, making things jittery. Okay, cool, right? Be able to find that immediately. What about a user that's at home or Starbucks and the Wi-Fi is trash? Like they have a proximity issue. Well, now I can tell you, like, hey, you have a proximity issue to your Wi-Fi. And you'd be surprised how many users are like, oh, I need to be close to my office. I can't be on the back patio. I'm like, no, dude. Unless you have an extender, which we don't have to get into. And then I actually see every single hop. So I can see like, what happens if like it's Cox communication? Like I see a bunch of latency right here. Be able to reach out to the user like, hey dude, looks like you're having, your home internet's having a problem. Can you try coming into the office today? Maybe Starbucks, right? Some type of visibility or a solution there. I obviously get visibility right here. I get last mile visibility right here and right here and right here and right here and right here. I feel like a broken record and right here and right here. And down over here as well, which means if something's actually down, again, you definitively figure out what that problem is immediately as opposed to, you know, spinning, uh, you know, circles around trying to figure out exactly what's going on in the environment. You can do this across all users, all applications and proximity. And the list just kind of goes on and on. And the last point to this is it's one thing to help out with those isolated incidents with like Zoom for one particular user. It's another thing to have users, like maybe the, the CIO open up a ticket and say, 
hey, we think that OneDrive isn't working, right? We've all been there. That's happened. And so now what I can do is I can proactively monitor your business critical applications. Maybe it's M365, maybe it's salesforce.com, maybe it's application three over here and application two down here. That if these things actually go down, I can notify the help desk. And that eliminates this entire troubleshooting effort and puts the blame specifically on this application or on salesforce.com. And now you can send out an email to the organization. And more importantly, you can say like, hey, if you're on the West Coast, you guys are fine because based on what these guys are selling us, everything is up. But if you're on the East Coast, we see that there's a problem. We've opened up a ticket with maybe Salesforce, and now we can appropriately move on. So team, unfortunately, that's my time. That's all I was given to talk about on Zero Trust. I feel like it's a lot of information. No doubt it isn't. But uh, you know, with all that said, if there's any questions, I'm happy to about, talk about anything. And if there isn't, then maybe I didn't do my job wrong. So if you have a question, come off the mute, put in the chat window and go from there. Do we have anything there, Mr. Venn? Nothing yet from the chat window. Gotcha. I Don't be a... bashful, team. Go for it. This is Infant. Uh, awesome work on explaining the ZTA, the Zscaler framework, nicely done. Uh, so when we connect different um, points from customer premises, whether it's a on-prem, colo, cloud. Um, is there a bandwidth limitation per tunnel? So no, not necessarily. So the, the question, if I'm uh, understanding if it is, is this, is there like a bandwidth limitation uh, on these tunnels, like, you know, where I'm sending traffic up over here or over here? So the answer is like, the reality is like, you do have to have some type of limitation, right? Uh, but we saw this a little bit differently. So let me talk about your internal applications and think about your VPN today in the, the theoretical throughput of that, okay? So I never deployed this as like just one device. I do it N plus one, right? So if your current VPN can do one gig per second, then guess what? I'm gonna give you three three of these little Z-Star things because they can each move about 500 megs per second and then the extra one for redundancy. Now, the cool part is since this thing is phoning back home, I don't need a load balancer. You don't need to load balance this at all. I treat this as a load balancing pool member and I distribute that load evenly across all those things. Now, at some point in time, let's say that you know this is this wildly successful and everyone likes it and uses to throw more and more people on it. If I need to scale that out, that's not, not a problem. And on top of that, I would notify you guys of like, hey, this thing is at the, like the 80th percentile. It's time to add another one into the pool member uh, for the load balancing group. Same thing over here. Um, yeah, and, and the same thing, like going back over to remote office, probably about a gig per second, but we can scale it out horizontally to be able to move out more and more traffic. Have you ever seen anything? Uh, so Invent, have you ever seen like a, a limitation that you felt like, oh my gosh, like that's just, that's too small or is that seem like a, a good plan? And the reason I asked the question, probably this is a long back when we designed, um, this killer to the cloud connections. Uh, we, we hit some limitations. I forgot the number, whether it's uh, 10 gig or so, but the customer was sending a lot of traffic to AWS cloud. And that's why I was curious if the number went up um, because they had a 10 gig pipe, they need to now route everything to ZTA um, instead of the direct connect. So when we take the 10 gig traffic, try to slice it up into 500 meg tunnels, that, that becomes a lot of tunnels there, right? So just curious, what was the, um, what, what the so, changes in the architecture, yeah. Yeah, so let me ask you, was it, uh, was, the tre was the 10 gig, was it going in or is it going out? Uh, the 10 gig is from the data center to the AWS cloud through the direct connect. Through the direct connect. Okay, so uh, fundamentally what I would say is I, I don't think that I, I wanna do that. So, um, and by that is like, hey, you have a connection here. It's like the, it's that express route or, or a direct connect going over here to like AWS. And uh, this is brilliant, right? It works, but I think that that's, that's a little anti-cloud. Uh, the way that I would look at this would be, you'll use this for like super large, maybe nightly backups or just like huge file transfers from here to here. But as far as from like your user population coming in, accessing these internal apps, I think it's far better to go with a connector in the cloud that's reaching outbound 
and not hairpin them back to a data center. Because in this scenario, if the user was coming all the way over here and you didn't have that connector, I know you guys can still see it, but you didn't have that, then right coming to this connector, then riding up and then forcing like that 10 gig, like I don't I don't think that's a, a, a viable solution. This is definitely something a little bit more scalable uh, in the long term. Yeah, I believe that's why we ended up we didn't make any architecture changes from Red Connect to Cloud, but I was just curious on the number did we scale, but um, thank you. Yeah, so I have one customer that, uh, so <clears throat> very, probably one of our largest customers, and I'm not, I don't ever name drop, so never worry about that. Uh, they came through and uh, we said, hey, you know, we can put a bunch of these connectors and scale them out horizontally. And they're like, yeah, no thanks. We just want to do like three connectors for every VPC and AWS. And like that, that like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm happy with it, but I, I don't think it was the appropriate way of doing things. But to them, they, they got rid of any concerns about, uh, you know, trying to overwhelm uh, any type of VPC. Each one of these VPCs had, a, you know, 1.5 gigs. Actually, it was over provision. So definitely 1.5 gigs plus that they could do without feeling they had any saturation. And they probably had four, 400 plus of those connectors deployed for their environment. Yeah. It's a lot. It is. It is. But, you know, they're happy. That's all that really matters. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Invin, sounds like you are a customer. So thank you so much for your business, man. We appreciate it. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, connect. Uh, if you guys ever need anything or you specifically need something, please let me know. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, move mountains to make sure you guys are still happy no matter what. Yep. All right. So Brian, if you will stop sharing, I'll go back to Dell. PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, we'll turn it back over to the PowerPoint. Let me say thank you. There we go. All right, so um, just to wrap it up, if there's uh, no other questions, uh, really wanted to just kind of talk to you. Um, we've got, a, as I would like to joke, a blue light special uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. But uh, seriously, next steps. Uh, NTT would like to offer anybody who would like a no-cost uh, technology lifestyle program uh, workshop, uh, specifically around ZTNA, Zero Trust Network Architecture. Uh, please reach out to Fabio Santos, and uh, we will schedule that for you. We've got uh, TLPs uh, across many areas, uh, including network, collaboration, hybrid cloud, security, et cetera. So, but today, the offer is to provide that workshop uh, at no cost to you um, that we can offer. So um, that is essentially um, a quick thing. So grab a screenshot of that. Um, you know, this uh, recording will be posted eventually and so forth. So if there are no other questions, we thank you all for your time. Uh, we appreciate the almost one hour you've given us. I hope you found some value. And on behalf of Zscaler and NTT, I thank you very much for your time uh, and appreciate everything. I think it was a success. Thank you, man. You're the man. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you, Brian. I mean, you know, you outdid me. I'm I'm gonna have to come borrow your office. <laughs>